are a couple of more slides I would like to run over quickly to finish off with. And I would like to, to go over a, a real-world example to start off with. So I think most people here are, are probably familiar with the Green Scare. Uh, but the Green Scare refers to a series of, of arrests and kind of infiltrations or surveillance activities that have taken place mostly over the last decade um, and that have involved the arrest and harassment of a number of different radical environmentalists in particular. Um, and so this diagram is a diagram of people who are uh, arrested or charged under what the FBI calls Operation Backfire. And that was an attempt to, uh, uh, to capture people who were allegedly involved in a number of different earth liberation and animal liberation front uh, activities over a period of, of several years. And so these, uh, these dots on, around the, the circle are different individuals. And these lines indicate that there was some kind of relationship for, between the two. And I, I drew this by looking at um, indictments, at lists of, of federal indictments, to see who is named on the same action. So who the government thinks participated in the same action together, and therefore they, you know, percept, they perhaps knew each other. And I think you can see right away by looking at this what was wrong. Uh, and the problem is that there was no compartmentalization. You know, they had a, a, a group here that was in some ways a cell that consisted of, of something like 20 people. And these people all knew each other. And so what happened was this fellow right at the top here, Jake Ferguson, uh, who was, you know, involved in many of these actions and, and who was also uh, a heroin addict, who uh, he kind of collaborated with the government um, in order to go to some of these people and... Uh, you know, this was years after these actions had taken place, to go to them with a wire and basically say, oh, you know, how about the good old days when we burned this down and burned that down? And so people, you know, conversed with him, and it, these were recorded, and they started arresting people um, in several different segments. So this was the original indictment in which uh, these people were arrested, and... Uh, you know, most of them, them collaborated. As you can see in the, the legend on your booklet, there is only one person from the uh, original uh, indictment who's still a non-cooperating defendant. That's, that's Daniel McGowan. Um, and of course, there is one person who unfortunately committed suicide in prison shortly after being arrested. But most of these people did collaborate, some very enthusiastically, I understand. And that led to a series of other indictments in which these people and then, you know, these other people were, were arrested or charged because of information that was gathered from, from these collaborators, from these informers. Um, and so this really clearly illustrates the need for compartmentalization in, a, in an underground movement and the need for, you know, general security culture. Because in this case, and in, in essentially all of these green scare cases, there is no kind of fancy CSI forensic detective work. This was human intelligence. It was actual uh, sources, infiltrators or informers like Jake Ferguson who gave that information. So it's possible that if all of these people had to stayed you know, totally silent, um, that none of them would be in jail right now. Um, and I think that there's another important point here that's kind of illustrated. It may not be totally clear on the, on the slide here, but some of these people actually fled and became, you know, went on the run and became fugitives after the first round of indictments. And this is an important safety principle that many different resistance movements have used. Um, so the compartmentalization offers one level of protection against networks uh, being compromised. But it's, you can't just do that passively. It has to be proactive. So, you know, there's a, there are usually rules. I understand that, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in occupied Europe, there is a common rule among resistance movements that someone who is captured was expected to try to resist torture for 24 hours. And that was to give the other people they knew time to escape, to go deeper underground, to change their names or to change their location. 
There are similar kind of rules in, in Latin American resistance movements and in many other places. And that's exactly you know, what happened in a lot of these cases, that people either uh, you know, fled and disappeared, or in a number of these cases, um, perhaps they were better prepared psychologically, or perhaps they were you know, just more committed to their resistance ideals. They're more non-cooperating defendants in these kind of later groups. Um, and we can see, just as one last little uh, bit, we can see the same thing in several other examples of, of it during, in the Green Scare. So there was a, a group that's alleged to have started a fire at Michigan State University in a biotechnology laboratory. Um, and they were kind of surveilled for, for several years, actually. The FBI even went to get DNA tests from them at one point and still couldn't make any kind of connection until one member of the group, Frank Ambrose, uh, threw out a bunch of, of his own, uh, his, a bunch of stuff, including his personal papers, a gas mask, an M80 explosive, in a dumpster in, in, the, in the middle of town. I guess he just picked some random dumpster. And someone came across this in the dumpster and said, oh, this is very suspicious. And of course, his personal papers were in there, so it was easy to, to, for them to come back to Frank Ambrose and say, you know, we found all this stuff. We know you did it. Um, and he talked, and he, he cooperated. And so that brought uh, these other people into jail as well. But of course, Marie Mason is still, is still resisting, uh, or is still you know, refusing to cooperate and refusing to inform. Uh, the same thing happened to Trey Arrow, um, that you know, there was one uh, person in his group who uh, couldn't keep their mouth shut, who was uh, bragging to, to girlfriends about how he'd you know, participated in this arson. And one of those uh, girlfriends, I guess, her father was a police officer, and so he kind of told everything. Um, and in this case, again, it was the same kind of principle that that group was arrested and that Trey Arrow was the only person who remains uh, you know, non-cooperating. Now, the case of the Sacramento Three is a slightly different circumstance, and I think that it's the sort of thing that we should pay close attention to. This was not a group of people who kind of independently formed their own uh, resistance group and then um, you know, were compromised by someone who was simply not loyal enough or not strong-willed enough or not smart enough to keep their mouth shut. Um, there is actually a paid uh, infiltrator named Anna whose job it was to uh, basically entrap them. So she went to these people and said, you know, we should really start an underground group. I have, you know, this great house that we can go and plan it all in, which of course was wired for, for surveillance. And she was really egging them on and saying, you know, why don't you want to do this stuff? You're not, you know, man enough and these sorts of things. Um, and so, but in, in the end, even though they hadn't carried out any actions, they all ended up in, in jail. So I think that this, that all of these examples, these real world examples, really underscore on one level the importance of uh, intelligent planning and kind of network design for underground movements. And also the importance of being really careful about who you work with and making sure that you really trust them and screen them. Um, and, you know, of course, number three, that people use good security culture in general and not talk and not blab about things that it's simply not appropriate to talk about. Um, so I hope that this has been uh, illuminating to everyone, and I hope that we can use this information to you know, form all kinds of organizations and all kinds of groups that are safe, effective, and uh, appropriate to the kind of tactics and strategy that they've chosen. So, thank you.